welcome back to Chaos Cast, the Chaos Community Podcast, where we share use cases and experiences with measuring open source community health. On the panel with us today are Josh Burkus and Callie Dolphy, both from Red Hat, and myself, Matt German Prey. I am one of the co founders of the Chaos Project and currently a professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha in the College of Information Science and Technology. It's great to be hosting this session. Callie, do you want to take a second just to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and then Josh will move to you? Yes, my name is Callie Dossi. I am a senior data scientist in Red Hat's open source program office. I've been at Red Hat for a little over four years, starting as an intern and now to being a senior data scientist looking at open source community metrics, visualizations, models, all sorts of things. Well, thanks for being here, Tally. Josh? I'm Josh Burkus. I'm also in the Red Hat OSPO. I'm on our community architects team, which are staff who focus on particular projects or groups of projects in order to help make those projects successful. My domain, along with my European coworker, Lenka, is cloud native, particularly Kubernetes, but all of the other projects that surround Kubernetes. And I got into that because I started contributing to Kubernetes when it was less than a year old, mostly because I was trying to automate something else and then got carried away with it. Nice to have both of you here. When was Kubernetes a year old? What year was that? So that would have been in 2015. Didn't they just have a birthday? It was the 10th anniversary. Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, maybe you could go into a little bit of detail. I know you just kind of touched on it here, but kind of what your day-to-day -day role is at the Red Hat OSPO, even what you're working on today, what you're working on last week, what are the things that are right in front of you right now? Yeah, so for me, as an active data scientist in Red Hat's OSPO, community open source metrics is most of my job. Usually the past couple of years, it's really been focused on an overarching project called Project Aspen, where you have specifically the Eight Knot dashboard, which uses Chaos's Augur project to supply the data, do a lot of visualizations and metrics on there, and have been developing that platform over the last couple of years. And so we have that. I haven't been working on that as much as of late, but one of the things that I've been working on more inside of Red Hat is doing different reports for community decisions that are being made to try to help people understand the communities a little bit better. A lot of times that isn't just providing the analysis, but it is providing context for people because a lot of times these reports are being requested by people who don't have as much open source background. So it's providing not just the analysis, but the context for it. And then as well on the chaos side, I've been working on doing some more research-based projects. They're still coming to form. But looking at Project Exodus, trying to find a lot of different examples where there's mass exits from projects or times where people think that's the case. And we want to dive into those circumstances more, see within the data science working group, the different tools that people use to see if there are any commonalities between these different occurrences and what we can do from there. And then as well as working on a network graphing to understand connections of projects with our intern Prudv has been going incredibly well. We've been working on that on and off for the last couple of years, but he's really taken hold of that project and has brought it to ways where I think is going to be a lot more interpretable by a general audience. And so I'm really excited about that, as well as working with Sean Goggins on looking at trying to model projects lifecycle a little bit more. That something has been outside of our reach for a while, but now there's a couple of people working on it. And so we're trying to see what we can do there. My job is basically stewarding projects and stewarding the Red Hat staff involved in projects. And so my time, depending on the week and the day and the month, gets split up between there's a certain amount of event management, particularly around KubeCon and the like. There's contributing directly to, in my case, Kubernetes and NCD. There's rotationally directly helping out a variety of projects. I think there's current 84 projects. The number changes all the time. 
but somewhere in the realm of 80 to 90 cloud native projects that Red Hat has a direct interest in. And then I also spend a chunk of my time doing committee work, helping run the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Currently, I'm co-chair of Tag Contributor Strategy and on the Code of Conduct Committee. And then more general open source sense, I also have positions on other organizations like I'm currently an open source initiative board member because that's part of my sort of broader mandate. One of those things to bring it back to metrics, one of those things about it is I did mention one of the things that has changed with cloud native is there's much more of an opportunity to have more smaller projects. I call it micro projects for microservices. And that's really pushed a need to be able to have metrics and automation for running the projects, not just for, say, building them. So listening to both of you, Tuck, I have a kind of a follow-up question here. So in the Chaos Project, we talk about open source project health, kind of at the Mm -hmm. singular project level. Do you all think about collections of projects, ecosystem health? And could you talk a little bit about how you think about that, not just at a singular project level? I would say whenever I think about ecosystems or when people come to me about ecosystems, a lot of times it's more about how they're connected and trying to understand movement between projects or how projects are connected. And that's mainly my angle, but I'll be, Josh probably has a lot more on this with his experience in the CNCF. I mean, because that's very true in the CNCF, right? Because there's an awful lot of projects that don't get used on their own. First of all, almost everything within cloud native runs on or enables or supplies a component to Kubernetes. And you can see that when you track the contributors, because if you look at the pool of regular contributors for almost any other cloud native project, you discover somewhere between a third And like 60% of them are also contributors to Kubernetes. So from that perspective, it's one ecosystem, but also these projects have a certain amount of autonomy, particularly when it comes to failing. Because from the perspective of the core Kubernetes project, even that project may be dispensable. If you follow me, it can be replaced with something else. But where we run into trouble is when it's not, because that's often the attitude, but it's not always true. Because we've got, I don't know, 11, 13 different virtual network drivers we can do without any of them. But on the other hand, starting two years ago, I was part of a rescue effort for the etcd database because we don't actually have an alternative for that. And when the founding maintainers of that database stopped working on it, it stopped doing releases. And so a lot of us who had contributed early on to the database needed to come back in and sort of rebuild the project. And then even within that sort of cloud native ecosystem, there are sort of clusters of things. And you can look at clusters in two ways. You can look at clusters in terms of things that deliver very similar features and thus exist within a certain area, right? For example, network drivers, storage drivers, that sort of thing. And those have a particular set of common interests and they generally depend on common libraries, right? Because if you're looking at storage drivers, they all depend on the CSI API. And so looking at the development of that API And maybe if the development of the API stops, how it would affect the adoption of storage drivers is a thing. And the other way you can look at it is stacks, because for everybody who's building a cloud native infrastructure, they have a stack of things they use together. And some projects are more often used together than other. And also some projects have more contributor overlap than others. And there's often a fair amount of synchronization between those, if you follow me, as in user stacks are often reflected in contributor stacks and and vice versa. So have there been times for either, Kelly, for you or for you, Josh, where Red Hat has had to take kind of a stabilizing role when there's kind of instability in these ecosystems where there's a real alert that has gone off somewhere and the organization has had to step in and say, yeah, we can help stabilize this or even working with other organizations to do that as well? Yeah, I can't speak for Linux just because I don't know enough of the details what's going on there. I know if we had one of the Linux folks with us, they would probably have some stories for you in that respect. I do know for cloud native that we're often in a position, and even I personally am often in a position of trying to pull together people who work for multiple employers 
through, say, the CNCF usually in order to fix something that's broken, stabilize something that's become unstable. That's interesting that at least the way you're describing it right now, a social solution, like people <laughs> to help stabilize. That's great. Open source is very social. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> All right, cool. Are there current things, kind of hot topics that, Callie, you're working on right now at the Red Hat OSPO, maybe around community health, things that are top of mind for you? Yes, and I would say working is a little bit too dramatic for what's actually happening. I would say there's a lot of conversations around SBOM analysis. I've seen it kind of bubbling up through the years. And in the end of 2023, I know the U.S. government made an announcement around a requirement of SBOM analysis for their government software contractors of some form. There's questions that they have proposed, but they haven't set a hard guideline. And I think that part of that is they're looking for the different software companies to say, this is how this could be done, kind of giving more propositions of what this would look like. And so it went from a lot of your info security, different security groups. Yes, they cared about the upstreams, but it's now become a lot bigger deal to understand the upstreams that go into products and how would we be able to relay that information? What type of information is important? And so this went from being a whispers in the room to being a very present problem. And I would say a vast majority of software companies have government contracts. And so this is not just some people's problem. This is everybody's problem. And I would say leading into that, one of the areas where it's also everybody's problem, not just from a security perspective, but also from a maintenance perspective, because for all of the open source projects whose names you've maybe heard, there are hundreds, thousands of others that are basically just little libraries, various tools, things that people ha depend on, but are not necessarily high profile. And the problem with that is that a lot of the work on those tools was honestly dependent on people having spare time to work on them. And as we've increasingly had a much tighter labor situation within the tech sphere, a lot of that spare time has gone away. And so important Little libraries, important in the sense that they can't easily be replaced. Little libraries and that sort of thing have gone unmaintained. And the first time that we often know about that is when something breaks, because we weren't tracking that little library in the first place. There was, say, one engineer from Red Hat or one engineer from VMware or one engineer from Oracle who was working on that library. Nobody noticed when they stopped working on it, except that it stopped doing releases. I would say on that as well, just the idea around people are talking about vulnerabilities. There's been a lot of high news points of different vulnerabilities from open source projects. You even have people talking about the Microsoft outage, even that isn't in the open source side, it's still in the tech sphere. And people want to know, okay, what can we do to predict these bad actors? How can we flag these bad actors? How can we do this or that? And I think that it's actually more from a vulnerability standpoint. The question is better asked of what makes these projects vulnerable? And that's been a huge topic. And personally, and this is also along the lines of some of the visualizations I've been working on, you're not going to be able to flag the bad actor ahead of time in the vast majority of situations. But you can flag what's going on within a community that would make them vulnerable to that. And a lot of times you can look towards the maintainer population to flag vulnerability. There's only one or two maintainers on these projects that are getting flooded with issues, pull requests, things like that makes a project vulnerable. And so you can make preventative steps a step ahead if you want to take action on that vulnerability. And it's more of that's what puts the project at risk for something like that to happen. And so it's a little bit, in my opinion, you have the question, I think it's a little change of perspective. And then if somebody's going to actually do something about that information, and that goes along what Josh has been talking about of more constricting of resources. How do we see a vulnerability in the upstream? What's the easiest way to do that? There have been a lot of tools in place for many years that can kind of publish these things. Yeah. 
but the optics kind of get lost sometimes in the sea of projects. So, yeah, people are going to have different opinions on this. One of the things that I've been working on is actually based off of a conversation that Josh and I had probably over a year ago is looking at the entire code base. And this is actually a visualization that we have on the eight knot dashboard of looking at the entire code base and looking at the amount of maintainers that have involved in different portions of the project and how long has it been since they've been seen. So if you have this huge chunk of your code base that only has had one maintainer that's been seen in the last year, that's a big deal. It's also, it also tells a bigger story than just saying there's two maintainers or five maintainers in this project. You might have a portion of your code base that has not had somebody that has done a review on it and been active in the community in the last two years. So if something comes up, a pull request, an issue to that area, your knowledge base is gone. And there's a lot of value of knowing that before something happens, but you also have to have a resources to be able to act on that information. And so this has been something we've been working on a stage of three different heat maps of looking at the maintainers and how long has it been since they've been visible, looking at people who've contributed to that portion of the code base and how long it's been since they've been active, and then looking at the number of pull requests that are coming in. Because that's also going to tell you how much activity that is going along around it. And if there's not any maintainers or very little maintainers for different portions, you know that you have a problem. So there's the vulnerabilities that have already been discovered. And a lot of the mainstream tooling right now focuses on that. And not that we don't have problems there, right? Because again, I've been dealing lately with a desktop library that's included in Fedora that has not had a release in two years and has three CVs against it. And again, it's the same case where you had two employees of different tech vendors who were maintaining it and both of them moved on to different jobs and were not replaced. And there's been a lot of focus on that because there is stuff to fix there and it's stuff that we already know how to detect. But what Cali is working on and that sort of thing, what we need to do more at work on is where are the areas where we are likely to have vulnerabilities in the future? Because particularly for things like day zero vulnerabilities for the really critical vulnerabilities and stuff, where an individual one shows up is relatively unpredictable because they exist because somebody made an unintentional mistake or in the case of some notorious vulnerabilities recently, somebody made an intentional mistake. And we can't really predict those, but we can predict when a project is a place where that can happen. So in addition to what Callie was talking about in terms of looking at where the maintainers overloaded, where they understaffed, where's their code that nobody knows anymore, but is still running. There's also a whole bunch of other things, right? Which that, well, once we have good metrics on that we move on to is things like, hey, which projects have no evidence that they have good testing automation? Which projects don't have a system of source code ownership control because very sophisticated projects like Kubernetes and stuff have a whole automation system, including owner's files and everything else that can maintain the idea that only specific people have the right to merge changes in specific areas. But projects that are not well-resourced often don't have that. And it makes it easy for somebody who shouldn't have, once again, either unintentionally or intentionally to push in code that shouldn't be there. One of the other things that I would love to look at when we get down the checklist is also, honestly, that I've been doing within the CNCF is looking for projects that don't have published scoping for their projects. Because one of the things that happens to create vulnerabilities is projects add features that never should have been part of that project to begin with. And because they're really kind of outside of the maintainer's domain of expertise, they often end up accepting really shoddy code. This is super fascinating. How do you, in this scenario, when you're trying to understand the different aspects of a community as a leading indicator for potential problems that may arise later, in the Chaos Project, when we present metrics to a lot of different communities, they're so contextually specific sometimes. And so how do you overcome the perhaps hundreds or thousands of projects that you may have in your portfolio that you're looking at and try to understand the data that may be just generated similarly across all those projects, but be understood contextually differently amongst all of those projects. How do you overcome that challenge of context specificity for 
what might be generalized data. Does that make sense? How you overcome that, I guess, in my opinion, a lot of times if you look at something like the 8 not dashboard, that's going to be giving you a generic set of different visualizations and metrics. But there's a lot of different filtering, like, oh, do you look at commits by month or do you look at it by week? Some projects, the cadence is going to be different. So you need to have that context within the community. And I'd say overall, the answer to that is that you really do need to have somebody that has at least some context of the ins and outs of that community to be able to understand the data visualizations. In the best case, you have somebody who's much more deeply informed. I think that should almost be viewed as like an empowering thing for a community that is maybe looking to get started with metrics and visualizations. There's a lot of tools out there that are set up that the power of really understanding it is that additional community context. And that's what those people who are involved in the community can bring. Those people are going to be able to get much more rich information than I will be able to. There's so many times when I walk through different visualizations or metrics with different people who are actually involved in the community, they'll point something out and be like, oh yeah, this is when this release was, or this event was, or these things very specific to the community. And that makes the context of the picture so much more rich. And so I guess it's going to be that you can't take out the human aspect completely whenever it comes to understanding the data around a community project. In the best case, you do have that context of people understanding how this community works. So I'm going to actually say the data collection is the hard part. That is the hard part that we're going through right now is that we need to move more and more of the contextual knowledge from the analysis side of things, from the human looking at the screen to the data collection. To give you an example. Maintainers becoming less active is a sign of something going on in the project, and that's common to all projects. The hard part is detecting the maintainers becoming less active. That's where you need a fair amount of sophistication in your data collection that we have to build up, starting with contextual knowledge. You have project A, where we figure out where we get the information about the maintainers and how to detect the level of activity, and then project B, and then project C, and then project D. And then once we've done this for like eight or 10 projects, now we have a data collection tool that's good for most projects. And that work hasn't been done previously. So we're having to do this from scratch because for such a long time, we've treated community data collection the same way that we treated it for server data collection, where we report a whole ton of raw metrics just sort of base level information, as opposed to more sophisticated synthesis of, okay, let's help the human along with what do these metrics mean. The number of issues reported has gone down by 10%. Is that statistically significant? Does it correlate with other events in the past? Have we seen this before? And when we saw it before, what happened? These sorts of things. We've seen that level of sophistication showing up in SRE, in, in SRE and DevOps in terms of analysis of system operations. But it's even a relatively, with stuff like Honeycomb and that sort of thing, but it's even a relatively new thing there because I actually cross over Red Hat from having been a DRE, a database reliability engineer. And I spent a lot of time with metrics vendors pushing on them about this stuff and saying like, hey, I don't want to know how fast my database storage is growing. I want to know if that's a significant change. Can it all of a sudden start growing a lot faster or a lot slower? Bringing that sort of level of knowledge transferring this contextual knowledge, making it less contextual and more of an algorithm, basically, as we pool knowledge about different projects. I feel like I could ask about five follow-up questions, but I'm going to move on. (laughs) All right. So it wouldn't maybe be a podcast in 2024 if I didn't mention AI. So here's your AI question. There's this seemingly ubiquitous generative AI it's in front of us. What's your reaction to generative AI and the work that you're doing at Red Hat? I'd say this is my first major hype cycle in tech since I've been in the industry. And so it's interesting to see how that impacts everything and how in a time period where resources are already pretty slim, you see something come in and take a vast majority of resources that didn't already exist. 
exist. And so you're seeing a lot of focus go there and trying to understand what's actually going to stick past this hype cycle and what isn't. But as a data scientist, I would say it's interesting because people especially now come to me and ask me about AI and I don't work on AI. I don't work on those things. And so it's almost being termed as a synonym or an evolution. And so I think there's a lot of cases where especially generative AI is being put into the whole analogy of pushing a circle peg in a square hole. Yes, that kind of fits, but does it really? And is that the best solution? Probably not. And I think people are trying to replace data science, data analytics, making quote unquote data driven decisions. It's what people have been talking about for years and trying to replace it with AI. Whenever those aren't things aren't synonyms, they don't fit the same solutions. And so there's a lot of context that I think where you can make better decisions in this case around your communities or better decisions around your businesses that are impacted by open source communities making those decisions driven by AI, by data science, but just putting the same exact data into an AI model and asking it a question, it's not going to get you very far. The biggest thing that I'm concerned about about the push for generative AI is that there's other things, especially around data science, different types of machine learning models, just everything else that is in this space just being overlooked. And there's a lot of untouched value and I'm concerned about kind of things just getting passed by whenever there's such rich data sources to provide a lot of different information and people are no longer investing in that. Are they though? Because I've also seen some open source ML tools at least get increased resourcing because of this AI wave, you know, because they're seen as AI adjacent and as a result, they get access to resources they didn't necessarily have before. I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) To be frank here, Generative AI is generative. It's not useful for analysis. Mm -hmm. And if I've seen generative AI show up in communities, aside from the actual new projects they're building for generative AI, which are interesting in their own right, for the rest of the projects and communities, generative AI is actually a problem because projects are getting stuff submitted like patches and documentation and other things that was generated with generative AI. These are never worthwhile submissions, and they basically impose extra workload on the maintainers to reject, particularly with the current legal status of generative AI still up to the courts, still undecided and still in court, even in cases where a submission was maybe of reasonable quality, projects can't touch it. Just from an ownership perspective. Yeah, just because if the courts make certain decisions about copyright, you have to rip that stuff back out. And so everything's on hold until they decide. So from that perspective, just looking at Gen AI, I mean, obviously, I work in Kubernetes. Kubernetes has gotten a lot of interest, a lot of new stuff, because a lot of the Gen AI tools run on top of Kubernetes, because they need to scale across enormous clusters of machines. So from that perspective, from new workloads that come with new resources attached to build stuff out, that's interesting. And there's going to be new analytical work to do because there's a whole bunch of different projects and not all of them are going to succeed. So one of the nice things about a hype cycle is it provides you with some opportunities to do analytics around trying to predict success or failure of projects, which allows Mm -hmm. you to test certain models. I have this idea that we haven't had the data to follow up on yet because it requires collecting enormous amounts of data of what I call super contributors, which is... I know anecdotally from having worked with them that there are certain people in the sphere of open source who are serial and concurrent contributors to a lot of projects. They're super smart people, polymaths with a lot of programming knowledge in a lot of different areas, been able to make meaningful contributions to projects in a lot of different domains. And my anecdotal experience is that having one of those super contributors take an interest in your project means that project is more likely to succeed either because they are better at spotting successful projects or because their interest drags in other people with it. And so looking at the emergence of all of these new generative AI projects is an opportunity to test that theory, to say, hey, we have a bunch of brand new projects. We don't know if they succeed or not. Let's look at the activity of super contributors and see whether or not there is any correlation, whether Josh's theory is just sheer anecdotal experience or whether it's actually supported by the data. 
With respect to contributions coming into open source projects that have been generated by AI for that point, are there things that you think at the Red Hat OSPO you're going to have to take into account to filter out that noise? I would imagine that's going to create some cloudiness in some of your analytics on some of the projects that you're looking at sometimes or it not. Actually, it would be interesting. We haven't done that yet. And it would be something that we actually already kind of readily have the data for is to just see whether, for example, rejections of first time contributions have gone up substantially, because I would expect to actually see that. But again, have not checked the data Yeah, as a leading indicator of those contributions. That's interesting. Maybe just a quick follow-up. Have you seen communities setting policy at this point with respect to gen AI contributions? Kind of an aside here. Or are they just, oh, well, we're just going to have to deal with tenfold? Yeah. No, both Kubernetes and Apache have officially prohibited them. There are probably other projects that have as well. Those are just the two I knew about. Okay. That makes sense. We're approaching the end here. I do have one last question for you. It's this last one about a piece of advice that you'd like to give other OSPOs. Red Hat has been doing this work for a long time. Red Hat has been a leader in the open source space for an untold number of years. And there are a lot of organizations that are starting their OSPOs that are looking to get them off the ground to play an important role within their organization. So maybe one piece of advice that you could give, say, a new OSPO that's looking to understand their engagement in open source? I'm going to probably be a little bit biased on this as the data scientist in the room, but especially for new OSPOs, I think there's a lot of value in setting up your infrastructure early of how to analyze your communities. Hopefully, for the easier case for you, you're looking at similar data sources, all of them being on GitHub or having certain consistencies with how they do their issues, messaging, things like that, and setting up that infrastructure from the beginning because then it's going to make the different analysis points that you want to do a lot easier in the long run. And then you also just have a set cadence. You have certain visualizations you look at, and it can save you a lot of time down the road. Can I give two pieces of advice? Of course. One is related to what Callie just said, which is specifically for metrics. Metrics need to be goal-oriented. There's a big tendency because, again, we are facing such hard data collection tasks. There's a big tendency among OSPOs to do what we call the light is better over here metrics. This is from the old joke about looking for your keys, as in somebody's under a street lamp and they're crawling around and looking for the keys. And somebody else comes along and they say, oh, can I help you find them and stuff? Where did you lose them anyway? Oh, in the shrubbery behind my house. And they go, well, why are you looking over here then? Well, the light's better over here. There's a lot of tendency to do that. One of the big things that I always rail against is people tracking GitHub stars, which is an utterly meaningless metric, but it's easy to collect. And so when people are doing the exercise that Kelly talked about, they need to start out with, what are our goals for this project, right? This is something we do in Community Architects and OSPO, right? What are our goals for the project? What does success look like? If this project does what we want it to do five years from now, what's it going to look like? And set up your metrics based on that, not based on what is the easy data to collect. Because if you just focus on what's easy to collect, pretty soon you start determining your tasks based on those metrics which are not what you wanted to do in the first place. And the second thing that I'll say related to that, which is very related to that, is learn from the DevOps folks, which is create processes, not tasks. Anytime you have to do something for a project, at the very latest, the second time you have to do it, look at setting up a process so that you can do it repeatedly so that someone other than you can do it. Because OSPOs work on long-term goals, We are never going to be well-staffed at any company for that reason, because it's very hard to find money to pay for long-term work when you have so many short-term needs. And for that reason, we need to be as efficient as possible. And the way that you're efficient in such a people-heavy task is figure out how to make something into a repeatable process. Great pieces of advice. Thank you, Callie and Josh, for both of those. We're at the end of our podcast. We do like to end on just a few, we call them value adds here in Chaos Cast. They're just things that kind of bring meaning or joy to your life. They can be short and they probably don't have to do with OSPOs or metrics. So I'll give an example. You wouldn't know, but Josh is wearing a gardening t-shirt right now, which proud gardener, which I love it. 
And so I, I'm going to go off of that one as my value add. I'm a gardener myself, Josh, and I'm not much of a vegetable gardener. I'm more of a wildflower gardener. And just recently, I've had two different species of sphinx moths come to my garden and probably about six varieties of butterflies. So this is something that I work on pretty hard and it's been mm-hmm. a pretty So that's my value add for myself. I'm primarily focused on vegetable gardening. I have the good fortune to live in Portland, which is one of the easiest and best places to grow really any temperate plant. I've got a bunch of rose bushes in my front yard and I don't do anything other than cut three feet off the top every year. They just grow. I grow a lot of tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and other things. And I propagate seeds and try to come up with my own varieties and try to grow stuff I can't buy because it's not normally grown in North America. I have a whole bunch of Oaxacan peppers that have been very happy with climate change, unlike a lot of my other plants, like the strawberries, who are not happy with climate change. So that's one of my things. There is a certain parallel between community stewardship and gardening that I could do a whole talk about. And in fact, have done a whole talk about. So, <laughs> Well, thanks for that, Josh. Callie? Yeah. As of late, the newest season of Big Brother just came out. And anyone who's vaguely familiar with it, it's a show that has 24-hour live feeds and a very large internet community around it. And it's exciting to have it back up. There's a lot of people and connections that get reignited when a new season comes. And so far, it's been going well. And it took until this year for me to kind of have a little bit of a laugh at like my job is analyzing internet communities and other community I'm very actively involved in is a large volleyball one here in the Boston area. And there's many times I take things that I've learned from others doing community management for open source and how that applies to other types of communities. It's pretty interesting seeing the mapping go over. I love it. Thanks for that, Kelly. All right, we are at the end of today's podcast. If you have a topic that you'd like us to cover on the podcast, whether it's questions you'd like to have answered or suggestions for guests or panels, feel free to reach out to us. So thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Callie, for being here. Until next time, your chaos community. 